Welcome to the Unlift. Today we're talking about vanilla. Yes, vanilla. The most common perfume material in all of Western perfumery. And it is a material that is used almost in the same way that sandwich makers use mayonnaise on a sandwich when they want to provide a bit of moisture or something to help hold the meat, cheese, and vegetables together without really adding any extra unwanted flavor. If what you have on the sandwich is enough, then mayonnaise tends to be used as something of a fixative or as a blender of materials to smooth out the flavors of your sandwich. Vanilla has much the same purpose in perfumery. It is such a likable, smooth, sweet, just generally positive material in terms of human interaction. And it is also a material that is very forgiving. So you can put a lot of it in a fragrance and the fragrance isn't really ruined for a lot of people. And last but not least, it is one of the better materials you can use to polish sharp edges, smooth, rough, angular accords to bring them more into a gentler wavelength for people. Like just, it's a way of sort of putting a finished feel on a fragrance, adding a little bit of vanilla, right? You can take those sharp woods and sharp green materials, really powdery, itchy notes or floral elements, and just kind of take all of those pits and valleys and just round them off and you create a nice sine wave. You just smooth it out. It's what vanilla does. And uh, whether we're talking natural vanilla or artificial vanilla. Now, the history of vanilla goes back a very, very, very long time. Obviously, the vanilla flower and the little pods it creates, uh, vanilla beans, as we sometimes call them, they turn up in our ice cream, right? As vanilla beans, little black pods. Different ways to extract vanilla from the plant. There are uh, the more common ancient ways involve some sort of uh, alcohol tincture of some kind. You know, that's why you've got vanilla extract is alcohol based, right? Uh, as time has gone on, though, we've also developed ways of extracting the essence chemically. You know, there are CO2 methods. There are other distillation methods as well. And if you're going the artificial route, then you can use the material called ethyl vanillin, which was discovered in the 19th century, but uh, really started picking up popular use in the early 20th century. It became Ethyl vanillin became one of the compounds in artificial vanilla extract, which was a much cheaper alternative to natural vanilla. A lot of poor families that wanted to bake, right? They wanted to make cakes and such, and they couldn't afford real vanilla extract. They would buy the artificial stuff, which you can still find. You know, real vanilla extract is still not super cheap in grocery stores. It's like seven bucks for a tiny little bottle. Or you can get like the fake vanilla in the big gigantic bottle <laughs> for seven bucks and get like literally 10 times the amount for the same price. So, and it won't have the alcohol taste because it's not based on the tincture, right? So there you go. Now we're talking a few dollars, right? So most people tend to go with the natural vanilla if they really care about what they're baking. But there was a point in time, especially during the Great Depression and other eras where it was more viable for someone to use the synthetic vanilla. Now the ethyl vanillin as we know it as perfume enthusiasts really came into use with Guerlain fragrances. Jacques Guerlain actually famously uh, discovered ethyl vanillin as a material for perfumes by dumping some by accident into uh, a batch of Jiki he was playing with. And that big heavy vanilla dose in the Jiki gave him the impetus to create Shalimar. Of course, Shalimar is more complex than that. There's a lot of other things going on. There's orris butter in that and a handful of other materials. It would be an injustice to say that Shalimar is just jicky with vanilla. That's not, not what it is. But that was kind of the uh, spark that lit the fire, if you will, was the ethyl vanillin going in the jicky, and then down the road we get Shalimar. So the point of this video is to just discuss vanilla fragrances in general. Since we seem to really have a love affair with vanilla, 
like I said, it's the most common perfume material, period. Patchouli is like a second. Patchouli is a close second. Patchouli is in a lot of things. But vanilla is, in some form or fashion, in almost everything. In fact, even fragrances that don't list a vanilla note, even fragrances that don't feature vanilla will have some kind of vanilla in the fragrance just to balance the equation. In the same way that I mentioned how ISO E Super is used to enhance projection, aldehydes are also used to enhance projection. Other materials become more supplementary, right, in that sense. Ambroxan is another supplementary material. Both top notes and base notes have a lot of these supplementary materials that help boost or alter other notes. Well, vanilla is exactly like that too. There are plenty of fragrances that feature vanilla itself as a subject or as a part of a greater whole, but then there are a lot more, this is the important part, a lot more fragrances that contain vanilla but make no mention of it because it's only there to interact with other materials, generally speaking, to smooth them out. For example, a lot of classic fougeres, which people nowadays will call those vanillic. And they're not wrong, you know, classic fougeres, especially from that 30s period, like Canwa, fragrances like Canwa. People will say, oh, vanillic, fougere, uh, Club and Pinot, same thing, very vanilla heavy. And well, those fragrances weren't really trying to have a vanilla smell, but unfortunately, the perfumers in question, in this case, Jean Carls made uh, Canwa, the vanilla was used as a way to smooth the rest of the accord because he was taking a Fougere accord. He more or less took Fougere Royale in its entirety, right? Because very simple formula, easy to figure out. So didn't need GCMS back then to really figure it out. So he took the entire uh, Fougere Royale formula and then did a couple of tweaks you know he added carnation to it he added heliotrope to it and then he upped the vanilla there was some vanilla actually in Fougere Royale not a ton but there was some so he made a couple adjustments and additions and that's how he walked away with Canwa and the idea was to make it smoother and make it richer and make it rounder because at the time he was trying to pitch Canwa as a female fragrance as a fougere for women to wear but men ended up liking it anyway so it became man's fragrance in time uh, and then clubman uh pinot would come out in 1940 uh, a few years later as a sort of down market take so clubman pinot was more or less the club de nuit intense if canwa was aventus right 1936 dana came out with canwa if that was aventus then clubman pinot was more or less the Club de Nuit Intense. <laughs> it was the cheaper version that you could find at most drug stores and stuff. You couldn't get a bottle of Kenwa, which back in the 30s and 40s, we're talking World War II, right? Really expensive, really hard to find. People don't think nowadays that Kenwa could have ever been an expensive fragrance, but it was. At one point, it was very expensive. Uh, now, getting back to the point, though, of vanilla. The large, heavy-handed dose of vanilla in that fragrance and many of the subsequent fougeres that came out after it led to that vanillic style emerging. But the original point wasn't to make vanilla that noticeable in the fragrance. It was just there to smooth everything else. But I feel like Jean Carls, who was, if you know your history, Jean Carls was becoming anosmic, losing his sense of smell. So some of his fragrances towards the end of his tenure as a perfumer may have been a little more heavy handed in some ways because he just flat out couldn't smell what he was doing. But he was Gene Carls though, so no one was gonna really question him, right? He was, he's a master perfumer and he's had all kinds of things. He made a uh, taboo actually for Dana. So I'm not calling his skill in the question, but some materials may be dosed a little more largely in his fragrances compared to other perfumers of that time because he was losing his sense of smell. By the time he made Ambush in 1955, he had lost all sense of smell and he was just going off of what he knew, right? 
and then had someone sort of, I guess, fact check his fragrances for him and make sure it smelled okay because he couldn't really smell it. It's crazy to think you've got a, basically a blind person making perfume, nose wise blind, but such was the skill of Gene Carls that even when he couldn't smell anymore, even when he couldn't smell anymore, he was still making perfumes, good perfumes too, good perfumes. Couldn't smell, still making good perfumes. Crazy, right? So we're at the back half of the video now, uh, 10 minutes and 30 seconds. We can talk about some specific vanilla fragrances now that you basically know the story, right? What vanilla has been mostly used for. Uh, vanilla fragrances as a subject, well, honestly, they were not that popular until recent years. Most people just wanted more abstract and complex fragrances in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. People didn't want to just smell like vanilla. People didn't want to just smell like any one thing. They wanted grand, opulent fragrances. That was that time period where people wanted that. Men wanted their buttoned up, uh, structured fragrances. Women wanted their big, opulent, aldehyde fragrances. People didn't want like solo floor exercises. They existed. I mean, you know, Mary Chess made a bunch of solo floors and stuff, but they just weren't that popular. So, you know, I personally don't see any real noteworthy vanilla fragrances as a subject until probably the 70s, 70s and 80s, when we started seeing more uh, vanilla prominent or vanilla centric fragrances. Uh, and then from there, it's just kind of the sky is the limit. But one of the earliest ones that I saw, you know, you had some things like Cody had a couple of vanilla fragrances. They had vanilla fields. They had vanilla musk. So, and they are, were, of course, a drugstore brand. So there was also the association of cheaper fragrances were simpler because back then the way they got cheaper fragrances was less materials, right? They, they couldn't really use cheaper materials, so they used less materials. So that's why Avon's and such are much simpler formulas than Chanel's and what have you now. <clears throat> so vanilla fields, vanilla musk, things like that. However, in the, in the public memory, again, uh, fragrances with prominent vanilla notes or where vanilla was kind of the focus, more recent. So most of the ones that I know and that I enjoy are not super old, you know. But uh, one such fragrance is one I've mentioned before. I mentioned it on one of my winter fragrance videos I did. And it is Starring for Men, came, coming out in uh, 1997 by Avon, is Starring for Men. And that's a very vanilla-centric fragrance, but it's a very floral vanilla. It's got lavender. It's got some nice bergamot in it. It's got a more of that uh, sort of powdery feel, but it's not extremely powdery. It's not like on the level of powdery as Shalimar, but it definitely has a heavy vanilla so even though I wouldn't call it a vanilla-centric fragrance, Starring for Men does feature vanilla heavily. It's a more of a floral vanilla, which I appreciate that. A lot of vanilla, especially the ethyl vanillin vanilla, the, the artificial stuff, is very uh, sort of cookie doughy kind of vanilla, real syrupy sweet. So the Avon Starring is more of that lighter floral vanilla, which I, I find more interesting myself. Now. I don't own the fragrance, but a lot of people like the Spiritus Double Vanille by Guerlain, which has been long discontinued and costs tons of money now if you find it. And that's basically like the ultimate vanilla fragrance. It's just vanilla, vanilla, and vanilla. So if you want a super heavy vanilla punch to the face and you, you're okay spending like $1,000 for some <laughs> overpriced survivor bottle of it, then you know you can go right ahead and get it. Uh, Another one, there is a, uh, another fragrance that's very heavy on the vanilla too. Uh, I can't think of the name right now, but it's a, uh, it was a fragrance that was apparently released by a monastery or something. I'm, I'm sure some of you are going to name it in the comment section for me, but that one's also discontinued. People seem to like that too. And then of course the popular ones, Shalimar, obviously, very much about vanilla, uh, I wouldn't really go to it as a vanilla fragrance myself, but some of you might reach for that. Same way with Canwa, 
I wouldn't reach for that as a vanilla fragrance, but some of you might. Uh, and then, of course, Jaipur. Jaipur by uh, Boucheron. That's another very heavy vanilla fragrance, but that one's also very heavy on nutmeg. So it's a very dusty, dry vanilla. So you have to be okay with that, too. Have to be okay with that. And then there's some other things that I could also mention. Like, uh, there is a very interesting vanilla orange blossom tandem fragrance. It's very cheap, too. It was a clobber from the 90s. It's called Sculpture by Nikos. Those of you who like those 90s clubbers like Lamal and you like the late 80s stuff, too, like Lagerfeld Photo or Lapidus Porum, you like that period of clubbing when everyone was listening to stuff like Hathaway and Aqua and London Beat, you know, that whole techno era. If you like that and the associated fragrances with that, then Nico's Sculpture is definitely one that I would seek out. It's not strictly vanilla. Again, it's like vanilla and orange blossom. But that orange blossom floral facet mixed with the vanilla, it hits really nice. And it's something that I don't currently own as of this video. I may eventually own it. But it's one that I've kind of put on my back burner to eventually get kind of list. But it is really nice. And as you move up into, uh, you know, more modern times, Clearly, fragrances like Hachivat have a lot of vanilla in them. Uh, Cedret Bois also plays around very heavily with vanilla. The problem, though, today is that a lot of the vanilla, which is sweet enough by itself, this is the problem. Vanilla by itself is sweet enough, but a lot of modern fragrances take the vanilla, which is already artificial, it's ethyl vanillin, and they double down with ethyl maltol on top of it. So they make these god-awful, Super syrupy, super heavy-handed, sweet, obnoxious fragrances. And the vanilla is just buried in like this awful, synthetic, sorbitol-style sweetness. So the vanilla really just kind of gets suffocated. It's like you're taking a pillow and you're putting a pillow over the vanilla and you're going, you know, uh, no tears, only dreams. And you're just suffocating the vanilla out. And that's what a lot of these modern fragrances do. So a lot of the Ultramals and Le Mal Le Parfum style fragrances and all the different Carolina Herrera fragrances that go really, really heavy hard on the sweet vanilla bomb stuff. It's, it's terrible because the vanilla doesn't really get a chance to shine. It just ends up being like this horrible fake sweetened stuff. And you get the impression of the vanilla, whether it's fake or whether it's real, you get the impression of the vanilla, but you don't get to really appreciate it. Then, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Tobacco Vani, but I'm not a fan of Tobacco Vani myself. If I want to do a tobacco and a vanilla kind of mixture, then I'm going to seek out what I think are more complex versions of that same a style. Uh, I like Parfum de Marly Godolphin. It does a better job with that. I think it's got more rose and such in it. And then also Montal has a fragrance called Aoud Leather. And Aoud Leather kind of also does that scent profile with the tobacco and the vanilla. But it also mixes in castorium leather and it mixes in a bit of oud as well and makes a more complex, uh, just, in my opinion, a bit more rough and tumble style fragrance, a much better fragrance. So, you know, it's almost like Tuscan leather meets tobacco vanille. That's the best way of really thinking about Aoud Leather by Montal, is it's kind of like tobacco vanille meets Tuscan leather together in a blender. And Godolphin is almost a similar thing too, where it has the vanilla and the florals, but it also borrows the leathery notes from Tuscan leather. It kind of does that whole best of both worlds. But honestly, when I think of Godolphin, I think more of a floral fragrance the vanilla, again, doesn't really get to shine on its own. But those, to me, are all alternatives to tobacco vanille. And then there's also uh, uh, there's Eau de Ba by L'Occitane, which arguably came out first. It was older. It came out a year before tobacco vanille. And Eau de Ba is definitely more along the lines of straight tonka, straight vanilla. But it's got a peppery note. And to me, the peppery note makes all the difference in the world. You add that extra bit of red pepper in there, and the contrast, the contrast between the red pepper 
and the vanilla and the tonka make all parties involved have more to say in the conversation. The thing with the tobacco vanilla, again, not to really uh, take a dump on anybody. If you enjoy that fragrance, you're allowed to enjoy it, but it's too simple. It's a one-two punch. You know, it's like butterbean coming up and going bam, bam, and you're knocked out, right? And so, and all the respect in the world to Butterbean, he was a phenomenon, but I like a little more footwork and a little more going like this. So that's why I appreciate fragrances that have a little more dynamic to them. And that's why Eau de Ball for me is better than tobacco vanilla. It has the vanilla, all the vanilla I could ever want, but then also has the pepper. And the pepper really, really adds the contrast. It's, you know, and it's much cheaper too. So then last but not least, my favorite vanilla. My favorite vanilla is probably a bit of a controversial choice because this fragrance was fairly controversial when it released. And it was the 2019 Gentle Fluidity Gold by Maison Francis Curjon. This whole line, silver and gold, were very controversial because they had gender as part of their marketing and you can never, ever, ever create waves with gender because you always get people who are just unable to accept that others think differently from them. So they want to burn you as a witch. They want to put you to the stake. They want to sink you with rocks. They want to stick you on the firing squad. Whatever they want to do, they want to basically unexist you because you think differently from them. And they will sit there and shout you down and shout you down and shout you down. You know. So the problem with the fluidity range was it went with the whole idea of let's create two fragrances with the same materials but in different proportions and create two different fragrances with the same materials and then we will not say which one is for men and which one is for women we will let everyone else decide for themselves we will make them gender fluid which is the whole point of gentle fluidity is it's back and forth. The gold one could feel masculine to some people or feminine to others. The silver one could feel masculine to some people or feminine to others. The whole idea is they both travel back and forth, hence the, the fluid nature of them. They're not making a statement about the gender of human beings. They're not making any statements at all concerning individual people's gender. We're just talking about perfume, right? But that didn't matter. That still set the world on fire. You had people wanting to cancel MFK and throw all their bottles away and all the other crazy stuff because they're just going psycho. And it's just like, it's not that serious, guys. It's perfume. Leave it alone. It's performative art, I guess, at its worst. But it's still just perfume. And there's not really any kind of political statement being made because Francis Kurjan is not American. He's Armenian. <laughs> and he lives in France. So he does not really care about our social woes over here, you know, in freedom land. He's over there in the EU doing his thing, being rich and famous. He does not care about us. So you can't think for even one second that there was any kind of actual statement being made with these fragrances. There just isn't. But why I say this one in particular is my favorite vanilla is it has that very, again, the vanilla is very floral. There's almost a booziness to the vanilla. It almost smells like a vanilla flavored cocktail. And I really, really like that. And honestly, for me, that makes it tops because when you complicate the vanilla, I'm all about it. And that is my take on vanilla. Hopefully you learned something. This has been The Unlist. Catch you next time.